All right, you can turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 13. Back to the Revelation studies. I'll take a break for a little while. A bunch of different projects to been working on and things. And uh, so, interesting chapter. One of the most, uh, I think, most significant chapters in the entire Bible is Revelation chapter 13. So let's read here. Revelation 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Okay? Now we're going to look here real quickly in Matthew chapter 12. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, we're going to look at the thing of this thing of blasphemy. Because when you think blasphemy, most people think of the unpardonable sin. So we're going to look about that real quickly here. I've done studies on it, but I just want to make a, a mention of it here. Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 and 32. Okay, it says here, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Okay, so blasphemy is directly tied to somebody saying things against the Godhead. All right, and, I'm, and again, you know, I'm not going to get into the whole thing of what is the unpardonable sin. I have uh, two different studies on that, actually. So, or no, I guess it's one study and then a, a FAQ thing. But uh, the whole point is, when you are blaspheming, you are saying um, seriously wicked things against God, is what's going on there. So, um, back to Revelation chapter 13, this Antichrist, um, he's going to be a counterfeit for Jesus Christ, but he's also going to be very hateful towards the Lord. Um, very interesting. But uh, verse 2, let's go to verse 2, Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. And, and, and again, you know, the temptation is here as I'm doing this study to start to try to exposit exactly what's going on and things. And that's not the point of these studies in Revelation. The studies that we're doing are for instruction and in righteousness for Bible-believing Christians today. Because this is not our dispensation here, Revel the book of Revelation. But we're trying to see how we can apply it to learn things, to challenge our lives today as Christians. That's the point of these studies. Uh, so don't be like, well, you didn't cover this and you didn't cover that. That's not the point of the studies here. This is not an expository study for the purpose of understanding exactly what's happening. It's just we're looking for instruction and in righteousness. Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Okay? Keep your hand there. And go back to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Revelation 2, verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write... These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. All right? Now a lot of people try to say, well, where's Pergamos at? You know, and they try to find where the city of Pergamos is and things. Well, I think that the devil's seat could move. All right? It uh, doesn't necessarily have to be wherever Pergamos is. Um, that's not the important thing here. That's not the relevant thing for us to learn as Christians today. The relevant thing is Satan's seat is on the earth. All right? And when you show up in Revelation chapter 13, over in verse 2, the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So um, can anybody think of a religious ruler who's also involved in politics, who sits on a throne. Hmm, you know, there is only one, the Pope. All right, so the Antichrist, when he shows up, he will be sitting in the position of Pope. 
I think it's going to be a special position where he's going to be considered, you know, basically Jesus Christ returned, the second coming of Christ, and he's going to be given the seat of authority. But I do believe that there will be a ceremonial pope as well. Um, you know, the false prophet, which we'll see here in just a little bit. But very interesting. Again, you see these comic book drawings and things of, you know, Satan's, you know, his seat is down in hell. That isn't it. The Antichrist is not going to be ruling and reigning from hell. All right. He's going to be on the earth. So it's a, it's an incorrect thing. And, and, you know, I know that there's like this evangelistic thing. You have like the chick comic books and others, you know, I know Ruckman drew some of this type of stuff. I don't know if I ever saw him draw a picture of Satan in hell on a throne, but I know chick, you know, Jack Check did and stuff. And I understand it's it's to get people to realize that Satan wants you to come to hell and, and you know, say the hell was created for the devil and his angels. I understand that. But I don't think we should twist the scriptures to get people saved. I think that's the wrong thing to do. Um, and Chick Tracks, you know, I don't just 100% give them my support. Um, they've come out with, uh, you know, gospel tracks that are, that have, you know, I know the one, I don't know if they still produce it, but the one they depicted Jesus as a black man. Uh, that's blasphemy. Jesus was a Jew. All right. I would be just as offended if, you know, they made one with, with Jesus as the Roman Catholic, blonde haired, effeminate guy. Jesus is a Jew. All right. You depict him as a Jew. And if there's black people out there that get offended at that and stuff and say, well, I won't believe it because he's not a black man. Well, then go to hell and burn. Just as simple as that. I'm not going to get, get upset because Jesus was not a German, all right? I'm a German. Uh, I accept him as my Jewish Savior, all right? And if you're black or if you're Oriental or whatever else, you accept him as your Jewish Savior. So, just a little thing I needed to say there. But the reality of the devil is, which very few people even realize, it's, just, it's right in Scripture, the reality of the devil is, number one, he's up in heaven right now. He hasn't been kicked out of heaven yet. Right? He fell from his position, right? but he can still travel up to heaven. He's still there. He's the accuser of the brethren. He accuses us day and night before the throne. He's in heaven right now. But he also has a throne on the earth. Very different image than what most people think. But it's important to keep that stuff in mind. Um, uh, that's why, you know, you say, why, is, why does the political world do such weird things and I don't understand and this doesn't make sense and why are they creating wars and why this and why that? Oh, well, because Satan has a throne and he sits on it and people come and bow down to him. That's what he offered to Jesus Christ. If you bow down and worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms. That offer has been good ever since the devil has been on this earth. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Satan has been given dominion over this world. He has a throne. Now God will hold him at bay and stuff. We're going to see that as we continue. The Lord is the one that will give, you know, get the final say so. But Satan has power on the earth. And he's going to give it to the Antichrist one of these days when the Antichrist shows up. And by the way, recent news, like within the last day or so, the Palestinian president is now saying we are open to peace terms with Israel. That's the Antichrist, brethren. The Antichrist, when he comes in, he brings peace between the Palestinians there and the Jews in Israel. We're close. We're very close. Let's continue. Verse 3. Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Um, yes, it would be a wonder to be able to get an injury in the head and come back from that. And I do believe that the Antichrist is going to be, you know, maybe shot or stabbed or whatever else we're going to see a scripture tie in here in the Old Testament. Um, but I think he's going to come back to life. I think he's probably going to be declared dead, but he's actually going to come back to life. And there's a whole lot of interesting things I could say on that subject. But go back to Zechariah, back to your Old Testament, the minor prophets. If you're not real familiar with the Bible, it's, you know, the minor prophets come after, uh, you know, essentially like Ezekiel, I think. I'm not sure. If, I don't remember right now if Daniel is considered a minor prophet or not. But it's one place that most of us, I think, are, you know, struggle with. You know, you Haggai and, uh, you know, and all this Amos. And, the, and you're going like, okay, what's the order of the books? <laughs> it's tough. But uh, Zechariah chapter 11, 
and verse 17. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. I do believe that that is a prophetic utterance for the coming Antichrist. That his right eye shall be utterly darkened. It will be closed. In other words, like this. Okay, He's going to have the left eye open, but the right eye is going to be darkened. Why? His head was wounded. We read that back in Revelation. And again, you know, I could, you know, it, it's getting to the point. I was talking about this with my wife the other day. It's, it's just getting to the point where it was like back when I first got into ministry way back 2007, you know, you'd like look for information to prove prophecy, you know, and stuff. And you'd see some story and it was like, oh boy, I got to, you know, do something with this and stuff. And, and, uh, you know, now it's just like, just look it up. You know, it's everywhere. <laughs> it's just, it's all over the place. You don't really even have to try to, you know, dig for information to prove Bible prophecy. It's just like, just look at the daily news. It's everywhere. You know, it's it's amazing. But this thing of with the deadly wound and his right eye being closed. Uh, you know, I saw some people in the comments were talking about the Passion movie um, with Mel Gibson. Uh, that is a Roman Catholic heretical thing. The woman that played the Satan character was actually a porn star as was, uh, I think, the woman that played Mary Magdalene or something like that. Um, these, some of these actors have been in porn movies. Okay, uh, that's kind of an issue. You know, I take issue with that. But uh, not only that, but the Christ in the Passion movie, his eye, his right eye is swollen shut. Now, you show me that anywhere in Scripture about Jesus Christ. Not only that. But you'll see pictures, and again, you know, there's both. They do both right and left eye, but you'll see the thing of Hollywood actors. And they do this thing like they go like that, and they like darken their one eye, or, you know, and many times it's the right eye. They're doing this triangle thing and stuff, the all seeing eye, you know, goofy little, you know, stupid nonsense. Look at us, we're little devil worshiping Satanists, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you're going to burn in hell. Is it worth it? What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Stupid. Very stupid. So, you know, there are definitely things, pictures and things, artistic pictures of stars and models and whatever else, and they're purposefully covering the right eye. I just thought that was very interesting. They're getting ready to have their Savior come, the Antichrist. Well, let's continue. Verse 4, Revelation chapter 13. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? i got to turn here because this is just one of my favorite things. Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Turn to Revelation 19. Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse 19. Okay, we're reading about the beast here, the Antichrist, in Revelation 13. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. That's us. You're going to be in the army if uh, you're saved watching this. Verse 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. One man against 200 million man army. Jesus versus them. I know it's not much of a fair fight for the Lord, you know, but he just kind of wants to make an example of the largest army that's ever been amassed. Kind of funny, you know. But uh, who is able to make war with the Antichrist, with the beast? Well, just turn a couple chapters over to Revelation 19, and you'll get your answer. And again, you know, well, I don't know if that's going to happen. This is symbolic. This is, this, you know, these people are incredible that are going to serve the Antichrist. I mean, it's just incredibly stupid. Um, all the prophecies are coming to pass, leading up to the Antichrist showing up. When he comes in, in in the book of Daniel, he makes peace between the Jews and the Arabs. Right? He brings in a makes a peace covenant. Right? We're this close to it. There's a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. 
we're this close to it. Everything is coming to pass. So logically, if all those things are coming to pass, Israel has become a nation again and all these other things, and the Pauline epistles, there's prophecies in there, and, and it's, it's all just like boom, 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 coming to pass. You know, we read back in Revelation about uh, chapter 11, about the two witnesses laying in the streets of, of Jerusalem, the city, you know, where our Lord was crucified, Jerusalem, and the whole world sees them. You know, that's true now. Why? We have satellite television. All these things are coming to pass. But these dumb bunnies, they say, well, yes, okay, all that stuff's coming to pass, but I think it might end up differently. You know, maybe it won't be Revelation 19. Maybe that part won't happen. <laughs> uh, yes, it will. Uh, this, this is God's book here. The God of heaven and earth, right here, the God of the universe, he wrote the book. It's his book. Uh, Peter said, we have been given a more sure word of prophecy. The thing that separates our Bible from the other writings of other religions out there is our Bible tells you exactly what's going to happen in the future. And to be able to do that, you have to be a holy God outside of our time that can write the book from beginning to end, tell you what you need to know. Right? It's right there. Why on earth would you serve the Antichrist knowing that he's one day going to just be flicked right down into the lake of fire by the Lord Jesus Christ. Comes back and he says, hey, army, back be here behind him, bride of Christ, I'll be in it. You know, you'll be in it if you're saved. And the Lord says, check this out. You know, whoosh, there goes the beast and the false prophet. Ah, down in the lake of fire. See you in a thousand years. The great white throne judgment. You know, going to be great. Looking forward to it. So, Lord answers the question there in verse 4, Revelation chapter 13. Well, let's go to Revelation, or excuse me, verse 5. I put this little piece of paper here. I'm getting confusing after a while. Uh, and, there were give, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Okay, three and a half years. All right, so you, you look at the different prophecies and you add this thing up. It's two different periods of three and a half and three and a half. And I don't, know how, I don't know how people can't see that. You know, three and a half and three and a half is seven. And I get this thing all the time with people, you know, all millennials and preterists and the wing nuts. And they, they come out and they say, nowhere in the Bible does it say seven years. Okay, uh, three and a half and three and a half is what? You know, they apparently can't add that up. But uh, just thought this was very interesting. There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Uh, you know that that exists today? Isn't it amazing the kind of stuff that we'll see in the comments or people will say about the Lord Jesus Christ right now? You know what you're seeing? Oh, the future recipients of the mark of the beast and ultimately God's wrath. That's what you're seeing. We are literally... Think about this for a minute. We are literally walking on the planet with the people that will eventually be taking the mark of the beast and getting God's wrath. No more opportunity to get saved. The only dispensation ever, time of Jacob's trouble, seven years, where somebody can do something where they can't be, you know, can't be forgiven. As far as, you know, I know that there's the unpardonable sin, but I'm saying the vast majority of people are going to take the mark of the beast and they're going to be damned and there isn't going to be any repentance granted to them. There's not going to be any kind of a, uh, okay, I see you're sorry you made the wrong decision. You know, it's okay. You know, no. You take that mark and you worship the beast, you're finished. We'll see about that next, in the next study we do on Revelation 14. I just thought that was interesting. But let's look about this thing, this spirit, the spirit of Antichrist. Turn to 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, First John chapter 2, verse 18 and 19, little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, that's the beast, Revelation 13, even now are there many Antichrists. You say, wait a second though, brother, 
how could they hear that the Antichrist will come? Revelation wasn't even revealed to John at this point. Uh, yeah, but you see, John knew about the book of Daniel. And the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet that Jesus Christ talked about in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. See? Uh, yeah, he knew about the Antichrist. And it was not some system, okay? It's a man. But let's get back to the verse here. As ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists. How do you identify these? You say, well, then there's more than one. This has to be a system. No, keep reading. Whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. You know, I'm just going to tell you a little analogy here. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's being made in China right now. And I have seen this thing so many times. I have bought something years ago when it was still made in America or still made some other reputable country. And it'll last for years and years and years. does a great job. But second law of thermodynamics, everything breaks. Everything, you know, the law of entropy, everything gets worse and worse with time. So, you know, things will break down. You go back out to buy a replacement. What, it's made in China now? You know, no, brother. Okay, all right, well, I guess I don't have a choice. You know, and you look around. Well, there's something, but it's like $300 more or something crazy or whatever. You buy something made in China, you look at it, and you go, well... I guess it'll work, you know, I guess. And you take that thing out and you go to test it and it's working okay for a little while and all of a sudden when you need it, some kind of a thing, you know, you go to use it and it lets you down. It fails. You say, what's this analogy about? Well, it's a lot like a lot of professing Christians. You see, there's a lot of professing Christians that could have fooled real Bible believers years and years ago. But now as the world is getting worse and worse and worse, you start to realize they're not made, you know, they don't have it made with the Lord, I'll say it that way, okay? They're not saved. They're not genuinely converted. Our text talks about that. There are many antichrists. Again, understanding this word antichrist. Antichrist, yes, it means they're against Christ, but it also means a counterfeit, you see. There are many people that are counterfeit Christians. Lots of them. You know, I mean, there's a track put out by Dr. Ruckman, and I know others have done similar things. They'll say, millions disappear, you know, tracked on the rapture. Millions disappear. I don't think it's going to be millions. I think it's going to be a few hundred thousand uh, Christians that are going to be leaving at the rapture. It's going to be way less than what people think. And it's not because I want that. Not because only my followers, you know. No, I don't want that. I want to see people get saved. That's the whole reason of me being in ministry. But I have to face the facts. A lot of people that I thought at one time were saved have proved themselves to be lost. And I see that thing time and time and time again. What's going on there? They went out from us. They were part of us at one point. But they were not of us. They were never genuinely saved. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. You'll see these people, and you know, again, another one of the big attacks on me, I've seen this thing where people say, I used to watch Brian, you know, and uh, they'll still call me Brother Brian, which is kind of funny, because if I'm lost, then you know, how can I be a brother? But they'll say, I used to watch Brian, and it's just such a shame. He really, he was good at first, and then he really went off. And I'm like, okay, on what? Well, on salvation. You're teaching work salvation now. I'm going, okay, I've never taught work salvation, nor will I ever. You know, I teach salvation produces a changed life. Duh, you know. I mean, uh, I have a personal relationship with Jesus and nothing changed. Um, okay, the God of the universe, His Spirit just moved into my life and nothing happened. Uh, I mean, it's insanity. And, you know, prayer is a work. And I see this, I get this thing, you know. And, and I say, what should I do? They say, you need to repent of your repenting, uh, preaching repentance, and get back to just believing. Well, if it's just belief, then it wouldn't hurt to do anything else along with that belief. What you can't, you can't have anything but belief. It just, 
It's cuckoo nonsense. And again, you know, looking at my ministry, listen to the stuff I've done years ago. You know, if I change something in the in what I'm preaching, I will come out and publicly apologize for saying, you know, I was teaching it wrong. I apologize. But everything else I teach, it's been the same thing for years and years and years. I've stuck to it. I've continued to preach the gospel the same way all these years. I haven't changed it. All right? But the people that uh, went out from us, they didn't continue with us. Well, they once believed in a changed life. They once believed repentance meant a, a, a change in their attitude towards sin and things. You know, and just these people just pick apart every little single thing. It just it just irritates me. Look, you're a sinner. Come to the Lord. Right? Understand, He died for sinners. Come to the Lord. Pray to Him. Call upon His name. I mean, that's when prayer starts. When a sinner comes to God and says, God, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I need to be saved. You know, that's when your prayer life starts. It's not a false gospel. It's not. You know, it's insanity. What's going on? They have the spirit of Antichrist. That's why I call them satanic. That's why I don't hold back anything on these people. They are satanic. You know? I mean, come to the Lord the best way you know how. All right? You don't have to pray some specific word-for-word -word prayer or something or whatever else. Just come say, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. Jesus died on the cross, and that's my only chance. I understand that. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Simple. At least you'd think it would be. But jump down to verse 22 there in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 22 and 23. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever de denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Okay, so you see these people, they deny that Jesus is the Christ. And it's so funny because there's so many people now that are coming out and they're literally saying Jesus is the Messiah. And they're changing the text of the King James Bible and even, even the Nestle's text. I mean, I could show you the, you know, the wording and stuff in the thing. I'm not going to for sake of time, but I mean, the Nestle's text, it's Christos. It's the Greek word for Christ. It is not a word for Messiah. And Messiah does appear in one verse in the New Testament. But, you know, it, you know it's about Messiah that is being interpreted you know, Christ or whatever, you know. So Messiah is there in the, in the Greek text for the New Testament. But the word that the Lord chose to originally inspire there was Christ. But these people, they'll take Christ away and they say Messiah. And it's so important to leave it as Christ. Why? Because that's what God wanted. <laughs> but these people, they'll come along and they'll actually deny that Jesus is the Christ. They'll say the Messiah. And I know, you know, it's, it's the anointed one and all that other stuff, but it's just, it's weird. But you'll actually also have people that say that, no, Jesus, you know, he wasn't God manifest in the flesh. Again, the new versions, you know, pervert that text in 1 Timothy. They'll, they'll take that away, you know. And there's people that say, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe that Jesus was God and all this. I mean, it's, it's just, it's so warped. Those are people who have the spirit of Antichrist. But I want you to notice something very, very interesting here. Verse 23. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. Semicolon. Okay? Or colon, I guess that is. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Did you notice those last ten words? They're all in italics. At least they should be if you have the you know King James Bible there. It's funny because, you know, a lot of the new versions, they don't put words in italics that they had to add to the text. All right. When you translate from one language, language to another, you'll find out it's never word for word translation. Uh, you're going to have to say, OK, add a word here or there or whatever else. The King James translators were honest and they would put whenever they had to add a word to make the text, to make the verse flow, they had to, they would put it in, in italics. That's what the italicized words mean in your King James Bible. But here's the interesting part. The 10 words at the end of verse 23 there, those 10 words, they didn't have any manuscript support for that, putting that in there. But they put it in anyhow. See, the King James translators weren't just using the uh, Textus Receptus right here. They were also using ancient translations. 
And I don't know, I wasn't sitting in there on the committee and whatever else, but for some reason, they decided those 10 words should be in there. But they didn't have any Greek text support for it. Didn't matter. The Lord was directing them. They said, I think that that should be in there. Here's the interesting thing. After the King James Bible was translated, years and years later, when you know, time went by, they found ancient manuscripts that contained those 10 words. Now you explain that to me. Although the Holy Spirit wasn't there and inspiring things and whatever else, then why is it that they were honest enough to put those 10 words in there in italics saying, no, we don't have Greek support for this, but they should be in there. And years and years later, they find manuscripts with the 10 words that were missing. Ancient manuscripts. Hmm. How about that? It's called the Lord playing jokes on the uh, scholarly community. <laughs> but let's look here at 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And again, compare this to the end times that we're living in. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Can you say a big hearty amen to that today? Absolutely. Verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. I made emphasis on the word is. Why? Because the new versions will change it to has come in the flesh. Okay? Has means that he's a, you kind of say like has been. He's in the past. Is is what you say about somebody that is still alive today. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. That's the right way to say it. So the new versions, by the way they translate it, they literally are proving that they have the spirit of Antichrist. And I've spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours collating the NIV. Uh, did that years and years ago. And I can tell you, um, there's definitely a spirit of Antichrist in that thing. Uh, you can feel a very evil spirit when you really spend a lot of time in that book. But let's continue. Verse 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. The Spirit's always been there. You know, you read back another place where it says, we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. So Bible corruption was going on in the first century. Uh, Paul talked about, you know, people sending letters as from us and saying that we didn't write this. Recently heard some of the brethren were saying about that somebody created a Facebook page, making it look like it was my Facebook page. Um, and it was all kinds of distorted stuff trying to make me look bad and whatever else. I mean, there's, there's people who the whole purpose in their life apparently right now is to hate me and my wife and my son. I mean, I'm glad I give them something to do, you know, I guess, but, you know, it's crazy. Uh, when you are saved, you're going to get that. You're going to get the evil report and good report. But look, let's continue here. Verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have over overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. There are places where Christians can agree to disagree. Sure. Okay. What you eat. One eats meat, one eats herbs. Don't judge each other on that. Okay? Um, holidays. One man esteems one day alike, all every day alike. The other man esteems one day above another. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Romans chapter 14. Okay? Meat, holidays, and uh, head coverings is another one. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, I think it's 11. I always get those two confused. 10 or 11. It's right in there. And uh, talks about... Um, if any man be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. So, you know, wearing head coverings and things like that, it's more of a cultural deal, uh, but you're not forced to, okay? Those are areas that you can agree to disagree on. But a lot of, you know, doctrinal things, no, there's not supposed to be disagreement. We're supposed to be all in one accord, all speaking the same thing in the same mind, the same judgment. First Corinthians chapter 1 talks about that. And so what's the test? You get the people with the spirit of Antichrist and 
it's just like they're going to have all these really weird, bizarre things and stuff, and it's just like this is doctrinal stuff. Um, and they're not going to listen. And it's like you try to talk to them about it, and they won't budge on, you know, in their system and things like that. What's going on? Spirit of Antichrist. That's what they have. You know, I mean, there's so many of these people. They just, you know, writing. Oh, you're, you know, you finished. You're, you're done. You're, you're just expose yourself, and you're, you're a heretic, and this, and blah, blah. And I'm, and nobody listens to you anymore. And I'm going, okay. We get letters all the time. People saying we thank the Lord for your ministry, and it just means so much to us. And I learned so much, and whatever else. And I'm going, you know, somebody didn't write here. You know, you know, and I'm, I'm encouraged by a lot of the stuff the Lord shows me. You know, and, and has showed us, and I mean, we do a lot of research, we find out a lot of things, and it's an exciting life when you're a Christian. Um, you know, again, you know, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is not speaking in unknown tongues or other tongues or whatever else for a Christian to, today. You know, that was there for the Jews in the first century, you know, for the signs, the Jews require a sign. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit today for a Christian is what's your attitude towards the truth? You have the Holy Spirit come into you at salvation. You will just have this massive appetite for the truth. And it's not always positive. Most of the time it's negative. You know? <laughs> but you don't care. You're just like, you know what? This stuff is really vexing to me, but I don't even care. I just want to know more. I just want to learn more. What, you know, ooh. And that's just, you're just watching videos all the time. You're listening to preaching and you're just like reading the Bible. And that's the Holy Spirit. Lost world, uh, they don't have that. And they can fake it for a little while, you know, and they can kind of fool you into thinking that, uh, you know, well, we're, well, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. It'll come out. It'll come out. Just like that thing that's made in China. It might work good at first, but after a while, you know, you're pulling, pull, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm looking over here, I got my cordless drill, that's why I'm going like this. I'm not talking about Chinese-made guns. Don't even waste money on that. I'm saying, you know, like cordless drills and stuff, a lot of them were, used to be made in America, now they're made in China, and it's like they start breaking down and the whole deal. So, well, let's go back to Revelation chapter 13, verse 6. It says here, And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Okay? Keep that one in mind there, all right? Who's the them that dwell in heaven? Hello. We read about it back in Revelation chapter 5. you got the 24 elders. You know, redeemed to God by the blood of, by thy blood out of every kindred, people, tongue, nation. Christians. Not the 12, you know, patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel and then the 12 apostles. They're all Jews. Right? Um, it's not that at all. It's 24 elders that are saved, they're crowned as well. So they've been through the judgment seat of Christ. I fully believe that. And then you have a great multitude of, of angels that are after that, you know, and, and we read about Jesus said in the resurrection, they're as the angels of God. And again, a, a whole other big study on that. So you see Christians, the body of Christ is in heaven before the Antichrist is even unleashed in Revelation chapter 6. And again, I've done whole studies on that. I'm not going to get into all that stuff. Um, but them that dwell in heaven. The Antichrist is, he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. All right. He's attacking the body of Christ because the body of Christ is up there. That's why when Saul was persecuting uh, Christians, Jesus says to him on the road to Damascus, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? We're connected to Jesus Christ. So we see in verse 6, them that dwell in heaven. Okay? Look at verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Now here the old posty toasties will start jumping up and down, and they say, see, see, saints are being persecuted on the earth. So if we get raptured up before the tribulation, um, then how could we be persecuted? Uh, you know, like, oh, I got you there. Okay, well, why don't we read the context again? There's people in heaven, them that dwell in heaven, all right? In verse 6. Uh, in verse 7, the word saints is a generic term that's used for saved people in any dispensation. 
There are saints in the Old Testament. There are saints in the New Testament, in the church age. There are saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. Doesn't prove anything. Okay? And you know, and, and you get these people and they're just like, uh, you know, I've seen this thing, they'll say, um, you know, well, how if, if the body of Christ is raptured away, how could anybody get saved? Um, well, the Lord doesn't need the body of Christ on the earth to witness to people. Okay, I think the Lord's perfectly capable of getting people saved after we're gone. All right, uh, for one, our testimony is going to be left behind. All right, people are going to remember. I remember they used to talk about this rapture thing. You know, I bet that was it. There's going to be false converts that never heard the gospel, you know, truly presented. They're not taking pleasure in unrighteousness. They're just, they haven't heard the gospel correctly. They're going to be left behind. There's a great multitude, which no man can number, that gets saved out of, the t out of this time of, of Jacob's trouble. But let's, you know, notice there, verse 7, another point I want to make here. Power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Power was given him. Where does that come from? Turn to Colossians. You say, well, brother, we already went over that. That was uh, the devil. The devil gave him his seat, power, great authority. Sure, absolutely. But where does the devil get it from? Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Unless you have an NIV, because they take the verse out. Or they take out the blood, excuse me. They leave the verse, but they take the blood. So, yeah. Verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Talking about Jesus Christ here. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Thrones. I know where Satan's seat is. The devil gives him his seat. The dragon there gives him his seat and power and great authority. Jesus Christ created it. The throne. It's all under his authority. Verse 17. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. All right. Um, who's in control of everything? Revela er, Revelation. Colossians chapter 1, verse 17 says, By him all things consist. Okay. That's like saying everything is plugged into, you know, we're on life support, plugged into the Lord. Everything. Saved or lost. Every single thing in this universe, it all is connected to the Lord to give it life. That's a rather convicting thought when you start to get worried and, and scared of what people think about you. I mean, we're part of Christ's body. They're not. But their life is dependent upon the Lord saying, take another breath. And if the Lord says, that person's threatening my son or my daughter down there, at any time he can just go, boom, they're gone. By him all things consist. But you see, the Lord has a specific plan, and he laid it out in his word. We have a more sure word of prophecy, you see? And so the Lord says, this is the way things are going to happen. And I've written it down, written instructions for you, so that you're without excuse. He is man free will. Hey, you want to follow me? You want to believe what the book says? You can see it coming to pass. No, I think I'm just going to go my own way. Okay. Well, uh, you can do that, but you're going to go to hell when you die. Because that's what Satan did. And the Lord prepared hell for the devil and his angels. So if you're going to do his example of just doing things your way, then you're going to go to the same place that was designed for Satan. So, 
Let's go back to Revelation 13. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Um, again, I thought that was very interesting as, you know, we get more and more, you know, closer to the rapture, catching away of the bride of Christ, and uh, this time of Jacob's trouble and the Antichrist showing up. Um, people are looking for a political leader to worship. I mean, you know, you see this stuff. Uh, I saw this thing the one time that there's like this website or something that like people can get into that, and they and it it's like they're like making it look like Hillary Clinton is actually the president when she's not, you know, because they they don't want to accept the fact that Donald Trump was put in, you know. <laughs> it's just like okay, mentally sick people. What's going on? They they're looking for somebody to worship. They're looking for something physical to worship. They don't want to live by faith, you see. They want to live by sight. They want to see somebody that they can worship. That's what Catholics are. They need to see St. Peter's Basilica. They need to see the Mass. You know, there it is. Put it in your mouth. You know, you put your mouth. Uh, and put the, there goes Jesus in your mouth, and there you can drink his blood and stuff like this. Forget the warnings in Scripture against cannibalism and eating flesh and drinking blood. We'll just pretend that doesn't exist because they don't really believe the Bible anyways. But, you know, they want something physical. See? That's the whole thing there. But another interesting point there, verse 8, All that dwell upon the earth shall do what? They shall worship him. And I've said this many times, but I'm just going to say it again. Where do you worship at? Church buildings. Oh, brother, there's no real condemnation. There's nothing wrong with church buildings and stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's fine and things like this. Okay, what do you think is going to happen to your church building after the rapture? Let's just assume everybody was saved. Okay, which, doubt that very highly. Everybody's saved in your church building. What's going to happen to it after the rapture? There's going to be people in there worshiping the Antichrist. Mm hmm Yeah. There's going to be a, a tremendous uh, revival of people coming back to church buildings. They're going to be worshiping the beast. If the whole world worships the beast, uh, you're going to need a lot of places to worship at. You know what I mean? This church is now property of Homeland Security, or the Roman papacy, or whatever they're going to say at that time. Really something. Verse 9, Revelation chapter 13, verse 9. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Compare that to what uh, Jesus Christ says back in Matthew 24. Um, it's the same thing there. Matthew 24 is about people in the time of Jacob's trouble, the Jews primarily. This is about people in the time of Jacob's trouble. But comparing Scripture with Scripture. But it's kind of interesting. I, again, another little challenge here. Um, if any man have an ear, let him hear. I found that kind of interesting because it's like there's a lot of people that just don't have the ears to hear right now. You try to tell them, you try to talk to them about things like this, and they just, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. You know, I, I really don't want to listen to this right now. You know what? I really don't want to hear what you what you have to say. I just, I, I'm hearing you, but I, I'm, I'm not really listening, to be honest with you. And you're like, but it's, it's, it's right there. It's exactly what the Bible says. It, it just look at the news, look at this, look at the. Yeah, yeah, you know, I just, I better things listen to, okay? This is negative. I don't like what you're saying. They have ears, but they don't want to use them to hear what you're saying. Very interesting. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 21. Another very true thing of today. It says here, In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. There are Christians of every kindred out there 
And yet for all that, you know, the uh, Jews, and I, you know, you could even include lost people uh, in, in with the Jews there, uh, they won't hear. Even though there's a lot of us putting out videos and giving testimonies and all kinds of stuff. Now, a lot of good uh, prophecy videos out there that give daily prophecies, prophetic updates, prophecy in the news and stuff like this. You still get lost people saying, nah, nah, I don't care, whatever. <laughs> Incredible. But let's go to verse 10, Revelation chapter 13, verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Okay, you can compare that to Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, keeping the commandments and the faith of Jesus Christ. Um, this is one of the big things, the big reasons that you know Christians are not going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. Again, just to explain it to you really quickly if you've never heard this argument before, if you're new to this. Christians are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. According to Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 4, we are sealed until the day of redemption. You can't be unsealed. All right. Um, if anybody takes the mark, if any man takes the mark, Revelation 14 verses 9 through 11, anyone takes the mark, they get God's wrath, they go to hell. So if a Christian could go into this time, conceivably they could take the mark of the beast. You say, well, a true Christian wouldn't take the mark of the beast. Well, that throws you into another contradiction. You see, because 1 Timothy chapter 5 talks about, if any provide not for his own, especially for they of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So 1 Timothy 5 says, I'm supposed to provide for my own. But Revelation 13 says, no man can buy or sell, save he that had the mark. So, Comparing Scripture with Scripture, you have a major contradiction problem here. What's going on? Well, the body of Christ isn't going to be there for this time. body of Christ goes and leaves beforehand. And there are so many Scriptures, hundreds of Scriptures that we could go over, arguments proving that the catching away of the bride of Christ is before the time of Jacob's trouble, You know, called the pre-trib rapture by most people. Uh, it is not a man-made doctrine or something like this. All right. But you see the two aspects there of salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble. The patience and the faith of the saints. You're going to need to have patience waiting for Jesus Christ to come back. Okay, if you're going to survive and endure to the end, again, Matthew 24, verse 13, He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You're going to have to endure that whole time period unless you just want to die as a martyr. It's going to be rough for people. I'm glad I'm not going to be going through it. Verse 11 and 12. Of Revelation 13. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Okay, notice this beast, the second beast there, is not replacing the first beast, because it says there, verse 12, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So he's saying, he comes up and he says, okay, worship the first beast who's still there. I don't believe that he's replacing the first beast. I know some people might argue about that back and forth, but I believe that that's there. Again, what's going on? What's this second beast all about? Well, another little interesting thing here is verse 11. He had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. Uh, the, the hat that the Pope wears a lot of times, it's like this pointed thing and it has... Like, you know, it's like a, it's like the Dagon fish hat, you know, it, to the front it's like this, and then he turns to the side, it has two, you know, it's like a mouth up on the top of his head, you know, be like this, and he turns to the side, it's like that, you know, um, very interesting, and of course it goes back to ancient Babylon and everything else too there, but I believe again it's going to be something within the papal system, I don't believe he's going to be some kind of a, uh, you know, political guy or something like this that you know, gets people to worship the beast. I mean, since when do you have a politician invoking worship and things like that? No, it would be a pope of some kind. So I believe there's going to be some kind of a special thing there for the Antichrist. He's going to be the king of the Catholic Church or something like this or whatever. And then you're going to have a pope there. Um, I really believe that Francis is purposefully doing a terrible job as pope, and he is. He's 
uh, just a complete waste. And I think he's doing that on purpose. Because when the Antichrist comes, he's going to bring that much needed reformation, you know, kind of like the last reformation, these charismaniac wingnuts, you know, counter-reformation, the Jesuits say, the charismatic wingnuts come out and say it's the last reformation. Very interesting. But the Catholics want a reformation as well. They want to have their system restored and brought, brought back to power. That's what the Antichrist is going to bring in. And I think that he's going to say, okay, Francis, you step down. Francis will step down. And then you'll have him there ruling things and then the false prophet, some other ruler within Catholicism, maybe a symbolic pope or something, maybe the black pope. I really don't know. I'm not going to be here. So interesting thing to discuss. But uh, again, you see this thing of worship for this world leader. Very interesting. Verse 13. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now, you know, it's again, this is kind of a really weird thing because, you know, I've thought about this thing for years and I think, okay, is this, you know, you get into Revelation and it's kind of like how much of this is symbolic, how much is actual, literal, you know, to be taken literally and stuff. And I think most of it's literal. Um, including the weird, strange creatures that come up out of the bottomless pit and stuff. I think that they're actually going to look as they're described. I don't think that they're Apache helicopters with cruise missiles or something. Uh, and I think in this case, I think that the false prophet is literally going to be bringing fire down from heaven. Um, is it going to be technology-based? I don't know. Um, you know. We just kind of take a lot of our technology, our modern technology, for granted, and we don't think about spiritual implications and things like that. And there's some really... Very interesting arguments for the Nazis getting into some of this um, high-tech type of stuff and whatever, and they were saying, well, that's because they're making contact with devils, and, and you see, like, the castle where the SS were meeting and stuff, and they were doing black satanic, um, like, black mass rituals and things like that, documented. I mean, they have, they have parades that you can see that were going on back in the Nazi Germany years where they were celebrating paganism, um, this isn't conspiracy theory stuff. They were get de definitely getting into the occult, um, Satanism and things like that within the Nazi party. So that's when a lot of the high-tech stuff really started to come in. And then they brought it over here to America. You know, it was Operation, uh, I think it was Paperclip, if I remember correctly, where they brought Nazi scientists from Germany, had them come here to America. So... Fun times, fun, fun, good stuff, you know, all good things. Yeah. Uh, verses 14 and 15, Revelation 13. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Again, who else is doing this? Catholicism. You're a heretic, you know, and they, they kill you and stuff. And you say, well, what about Islam? Yeah, Islam does it too. But if you look at the history of Islam, Islam comes from Catholicism. They both worship Mary. They both have their holy city. They both believe in holy temples and things like this. They both believe in holy war. Uh, and I believe that the Antichrist, purpose of the Antichrist is going to be to come and he goes out conquering and to conquer. Uh, well, we already have the crusade, the Catholic crusade that's been going on now for, you know, I mean, the modern one has been going on for a long time. But, you know, you go back to the ancient times, you had the crusades and things like that, Islam and Catholicism fighting. Well, we're in another crusade today. You know, the Catholic controlled militaries of the world are attacking the Islamic people the Islamic nations. So, interesting. But, again, I could show a lot of proof of this, but, I mean, you can do this research on your own. Uh, there are actually holographic images now that they're, they're using. I remember seeing something. There was some guy that was doing a speech somewhere, and um, they actually had him speaking, like, at one point and holographically projecting him at other areas and other locations and things you know, so that it was like he was appearing all over the place. 
you know, 3D image of him standing up there on the stage, walking back and forth, talking. Is that what it's going to be? You say, yes, that's definitely got to be it. Well, it could be that. It could be television. It could be all kinds of different things. I mean, everybody's walking around with cell phones and stuff like this. You know, you could, the image of the beast could be right there all the time, right in your pocket. You know, it's all the big brother system that they talk about, the cameras and the CCTV and all this stuff. I mean, it's right here. It's just like, I mean, it's going to be a nightmare, this world that's coming. And again, you see these people and it's just like they're so into it. And they're just like, oh, I think it's so cool, you know. And I'm just going, okay, <laughs> pretty weird. But uh, let's look at verses 16 through 18. Here's the big, the big uh, significance of Revelation 13. Verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Okay, so let's look at these verses again. Verse 16. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Now, that's very telling because... This is the oldest English Bible in common use. There were ones that were before it, but most people don't use them. Um, the King James Bible is over 400 years old, and yet it puts a prophecy of a future monetary system that would include implantable microchips. And I do believe that that's what it is. I know people make the argument, they say, well, in could mean like in the circumference of your hand or in like in the area of your hand right here or in this area of your forehead. It doesn't have to be inside of it. I understand those arguments, but I do believe that it is going to be an implantable microchip. But look at verse 17. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, the implantable microchip, that's your first option, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Three options, okay? So I believe that these three things that are developing, first of all, you have the implantable microchip, the mark, okay? The name of the beast. If you identify yourself as a Roman Catholic or whatever else, I do believe that there's going to be forcible conversion, but I think that there's, there could also be possibly, you know, that they'll be okay with different people as long as you submit to the beast, all right? In other words, you could be Hindu or whatever and just say, well, he's our savior or something like this but we catholicism is the one true faith or whatever okay um you're gonna have to be submissive to catholicism and because the antichrist is going to be in that system but you know there could be people that are going to have you know you're a special uh, baptized roman catholic or something like this and they'll have the name of the beast in other words so they might not have to have the mark in them now, again, I don't even know how all this stuff is going to work out. The only reason I'm mentioning it is because we're seeing it being fulfilled right before our eyes. I mean, it's just like the technologies here. There are implantable microchips, but you can also have people that are connected to systems whereby they say, hey, I'm a whatever. Uh, I'm with the FBI. I'm with the CIA. You know, okay, go right through. You know, they have a name there. Or what's the third part? Or the number of his name, 666. And I think that you can actually also have like the barcode, you have the two little skinny lines in the beginning, middle, and at the end, it's 666, the number designators there. Uh, there's that, there's QR codes, there's a lot of other technologies that are scannable, okay? So my belief is, after looking at this thing, you're gonna have an implantable microchip, you're going to have a name that you can be associated with, or you're gonna have a number a scannable number, something associated with you, and those are going to be your three options. Okay, now I do believe that this tattoo thing, this tattoo craze that we're seeing, all these people, you know, now, now there's professing Christians that are getting witnessing tattoos, which is absurd. It's like saying, you know, let's start printing witnessing pornography or uh, witnessing alcohol or something like that. You know, I, you know, I bought my... I bought my neighbor, my drunken neighbor, a, 
a six pack of beer because the, the cans all had Bible verses printed on them. I mean, what a thought, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get some big old tattoo of, of AV 1611 on my, on my arm or something. <laughs> I don't think so. But those are the three things that I think is going to happen. Implantable microchip, um, name, the name of the beast associated with the religion that he's part of, or number three, something with the number six, a designation there that you can scan. All right, be it a barcode or QR code or whatever else. Um, and, I, you know, the QR code, I did a thing on that years and years ago. Somebody sent me a bunch of technical information on it. And it's interesting because QR codes, it doesn't have to be perfectly flat. You know, you go to the grocery store and they got the little barcode thing there and it's like they go over the little doohickey, you know, beep, beep, and stuff. The scanner, it's not really called a doohickey. That's not the professional name. But uh, but you scan it over the thing and half the time they're going, oh, it's not working. They, you see them and they like hold it up and they're like typing in some number or whatever else. <laughs> kind of irritated. Yeah, the, the barcodes have to be flat. Whereas the QR codes I've heard can be on radius surfaces, kind of like your forehead. Hmm, very interesting. But verse 18, Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6. Again, if you're newly saved, a score in the Bible is 20. So what is 3 times 20? 60. So you have 600, 60, and 6. 6, 6, 6. And again, there's whole videos on that. I'm not going to get into it, you know, in this study, but 666 is everywhere. I mean, there's so much of it. I mean, stylized, you know, things, and the, the hexagram is inter intertwined sixes, you know, and things, and the trochaetra is three sixes together, and, uh, you know, it's everywhere. So prophecy is being fulfilled, and uh, if you're not saved... I mean, what on earth are you waiting for? It's just crazy. You need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So uh, I'm going to end it here. Um, I just I just find it absolutely astonishing that people, you know, still can't see it. I'm just like, what more do you need to convince you? But and then at the ears to hear, let them hear. You know, so... Um, We'll close with a word of prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I do thank you that uh, we're not left in the dark. We have your word, Lord, your perfect word, a more sure word of prophecy. And uh, it'd be a really depressing book if it ended with this Antichrist system and knowing that things are just worse and worse and worse. But uh, Revelation ends with some of the most beautiful promises for our eternity, uh, for those of us that are saved. And um, I thank you for those precious promises, Lord, and, and that we can be assured of our salvation. And I just really do pray, Lord, that you would please encourage the body of Christ that's watching this to stand firm and not back down and not fall away, um, but to just hold fast. And um, I just pray that you'd give all of us chances to witness and uh, help us to really build up resistance to people making fun of us because it's just going to get worse and worse and we need to um, stand firm on your promises and, and be confident that we have um, salvation and eternity in heaven. And I just pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, that is going to be it. Um, just really, it's an encouragement, I think, more than anything else for me right now. Um, to know that there's other Christians that are going through the kind of stuff that we go through. Uh, just uh, we're, we're so close to the rapture, and, and it's exciting. You know, it's, it's kind of a weird thing because it's like you got to do things in life to keep yourself encouraged, you know, and you got to, like, look forward to certain things in this life just to keep yourself from going nuts, you know. Um, you go out into the woods and... You know, right now it's still snowing here and still very cold. And it will be like that for, you know, the month of April probably. Uh, and I'm just like, right now I'm going, I'm just looking so forward to the spring. You know, and there, and you go back to Song of Solomon and there's some things there that look like springtime might be the rapture. Don't know for sure. But, uh, 
you know, I'm looking forward to spring. I'm looking forward to the warm temperatures and the, the smell of wildflowers and the singing of birds and the trees and God's creation. Looking forward to that. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of funny because it's like, you know, you have to do things in this life to keep yourself going while looking to leave this life, you know, and go to be with the Lord. Uh, just stay active, brethren. Um, don't let the people of this world get you down. I mean, like I said earlier, keep in mind, um, we're walking around on earth right now with people that in just a few short years are going to be taking the mark of the beast. Um, they have the spirit of Antichrist. That's why they won't listen to you. And uh, it's hard sometimes when you have family, close people, people that you've known all your life, and you get saved and they don't. And they don't want to hear about it. It can be really hard at times. But, uh, you know, it's about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what you have to stay focused on. And um, there's a chance for them after the rapture, after the catching away. Uh, not a real good chance if they have pleasure in unrighteousness. Uh, but it's there. Uh, but I just want to encourage you just to stand firm, standing on the promises. Um, so that's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching, and we will see you in the next study.